we have a number of uh, panelists who join us today online, uh, but also in person. Uh, we will first hear from the Assistant Director General uh, uh, for Communication and Information of UNESCO, Tofik Jalassi, um, and then we'll be John um, Okande, who will be following. Um, Andrew Pudipat uh, will be speaking about um, a regulatory framework for digital platforms and model you will be asked to input to afterwards. And we have Eliska, uh, Henriette, uh, Allison, Man uh, and also Manu uh, joining afterwards. I will say a few words uh, to you when we come um, uh, about uh, you when, we, when you will be intervening. Um, so we will then have a moderated discussion but before uh, that, I invite uh, our Assistant Director General, UNESCO's Assistant Director General, Tafik Jalassi, uh, to intervene with the opening remarks. Thank you, Cédric. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to this session of the IGF on shaping digital platforms for the public good. This is my fourth speech today, so I may be a bit repetitive, but I apologize in advance if that happens, because uh, obviously we don't have uh, a different key project or major conference at for every single speech. Uh, so, uh, you know what this topic is about. We, we know what you have been suffering lately, an exponential increase in misinformation, disinformation, hate speech online, conspiracy theories, cyberbullying, online harassment of professionals, and so on and so forth. That's not public good, that's public harm. Or at the minimum, that's public hazard. So there is one way, is to watch the world passing by and stay passive, or to try to do something about it. UNESCO decided to try to do something about it. And people say, why UNESCO? Where are you coming from? Well, UNESCO has a 30-year track record on freedom of speech, freedom of expression, safety of journalists. For 30 years, we have been awarding the UNESCO World Press Freedom Prize. So I think we have a record on defending human rights, and the fundamental human right is freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Now, it happens that freedom of speech moved online. How can we ensure that freedom of speech online is for the public good and not for public harm? And we know of casualties, people die who have died because of misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech. Let me give you one statistic from our work and research. 73% 70, of women journalists have been subject to online harassment. 73% of women journalists are subject to online harassment. 20% of them ended up being physically attacked. So this is not just something happening in cyberspace and so what? Uh, you know, skip it, don't l read it, don't look at it. Well, 20% of the cases, it started online, but it moved to the real world. And these women journalists were subject to online attacks and physical violence. This is one observation. Let me quote a Swedish delegate to UNESCO who told me last Friday, he said in an open session, in a plenary session, in Sweden he said, one in four women journalists end up quitting her job because of online harassment. Not just being harassed online. One in four women journalists in Sweden decided to quit journalism because they couldn't take it any longer. So, and, the, and there are many other statistics. I mean, again, let me go to Brazil, and we heard it from a keynote speaker who came to UNESCO last June. He said 78% of Brazilians take WhatsApp as their primary source of information. And you are saying it's true, and you are Brazilian. Yes, of course. This is alarming statistic because what information is being disseminated on social media, WhatsApp, or uh, WeChat, or TikTok, or Messenger, or uh, YouTube, or Instagram? Is it verified information? Is it fact-checked information? Is it quality information? When you have a country like Brazil with over 200 million people, and 78% of them use WhatsApp as a primary source of information, this is alarming. I find it personally alarming. So as I said, either we can watch the world passing by and say, well, it's a fact of life. We like social media. We are on social media every day. We have statistics that the youth spend at least two hours a day on social media. Two hours a day on social media. 
Maybe they don't spend two hours a day studying or doing their homework or doing sports or other things, but they are on social media. This is very important for our media and information literacy programs because it's not only conferences and also advocacy, it is also capacity building. And you have a major program called media and information literacy with the goal of making citizens media and information literate. So they know how to use information on digital platforms. Hopefully they can develop a critical thinking and they can distinguish between fake news and verified news and so on and so forth. So I think we, you, the issue, what I have been talking is the why such a conference and why UNESCO. So the last bit of why UNESCO, uh, last year in Namibia, again, Sub-Saharan Africa, we held the UNESCO World Press Freedom Conference and the, uh, there was a major declaration which is called the Windhoek Plus 30 Declaration because the initial World Press Freedom Conference took place in Windhoek 30 years ago. And this is the Windhoek Plus 30 Declaration in which it was clearly stated we have to ensure that information is a common public good, including through online means and channels. So we are taking that concept of information as a common public good and we are trying to address it in the context of digital platforms through an inclusive multi-stakeholder approach. The 193 member states of UNESCO, civil society, NGOs, academia, research institutions, but also media professionals, but also the technology companies and the platform operators. Without them, it will remain a declaration because these are very powerful, very rich technology players who operate these digital platforms and we have to ensure their buy-in. They are part of this conference, not only in attendance, but in participation in the consultations leading up to the conference. And that's a major development that they are party to this. Why? Because they can be also beneficiary, beneficiary from the outcome. What is the outcome? A model, sorry, let me see. A global model regulatory platform for digital platforms to ensure information is public good while safeguarding freedom of expression online. Why I'm saying this? It's a long sentence. I, I'm, I'm aware of that. It's too long sentence. Let me try to cut it into halves. If I say regulating digital platforms for information to be a public good, you may say what a journalist told me two weeks ago, <coughs> are you now in the business of censorship? What do you mean regulating platforms? For me, the, I'm, I, I fear censorship. No. I said while safeguarding free speech online. And that's the balancing act. That's the thin line between how to regulate while we ensure free speech online. But we don't want to see the public hazards. We don't want to f see the public harm on the platforms. I hope you understand the why we are doing this. I hope it's clear to you what is the target outcome, this global model regulatory framework for digital platforms that will hopefully will inform and inspire national regulators to set up their own regulatory policies. But at least there is a global uh, framework shared by all, including the technology companies and the platform operators. Because the tech companies told me recently, how can we respect national regulatory systems? There are 194 of them in the world. 194 regulatory frameworks today in the world. There is no one single tech company that can fully respect all what is in each one of the 194 regulatory systems. So what we are saying, yes, of course, there are national regulatory platforms. We want to come up with a global model regulatory framework spanning the world because digital platforms are by definition global. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> I'm not sure they are. <laughs> so just to, to, go, to wrap up, because we have uh, other business to, to deal with, right, Cedric? I'm saying that digital platforms are global by nature, are transborder by nature. We know this. We need to have a global regulatory framework and not only national regulatory systems. So this is an important session for us because we look forward to your questions, to your inputs, to your remarks.
as Cedric said, we want this session to be as interactive as possible. I tried to set the scene for it or the set the stage for it. And my colleague, I believe Rachel will proceed and uh, my, my colleague Andrew also presenting what is in draft one of our work so far. And hopefully your inputs will help us enrich that current text and move it to draft two which will be presented in February at the conference. And we hope that you'll be able to join us in Paris at UNESCO headquarters, February 21 to 23, 2023. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assistant Director General, for setting the global scene and uh, also the way forward in terms of the framework, the model framework, and uh, also the conference. Now, uh, UNESCO work takes place, of course, also in countries. And before we come to the moderated discussion, uh, we are lucky here uh, to speak briefly about a social media for peace project, um, uh, because we have in four countries looked at policies and practices on managing online con uh, content. And we are lucky to have uh, John Okande from the UNESCO Nairobi office uh, with us, who can speak about uh, Kenya as an example, so also the concrete situation in countries which inform our work on the global level of uh, set with the scene by the Assistant Director General. Um, thank you, Cedric, and uh, also thank you, ADG, for painting that picture. Um, I remember when we met uh, during the World Press Freedom Day conference in Uruguay, and we had assigned a sideline discussions on how it's important to also, from your popular word, uh, I don't know how popular it is, but uh, what you mentioned is we need digital hygiene. And this digital hygiene has to be guided by a set of principles uh, that uh, can hopefully help us create a, a healthy digital ecosystem. We have a short um, presentation just highlighting uh, uh, what we've done uh, and still an ongoing intervention under the Social Media for Peace project. Uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation uh, just to more or less build up on what uh, ADG has mentioned. Um, the project has three components um, and mainly the overall objective uh, is, uh, is uh, strengthen society's resilience to potential harmful content spread online while protecting freedom of expression and enhancing the promotion of peace narratives on social media platforms. So in within the Kenyan context, we've been able to align our interventions in three components, and that one, we were able to carry out two national researches um, on one, the existing legal mechanisms within the country and the, ne the, the gaps that are there in uh, within uh, those frameworks. And uh, the second component will be piloting new tools to improve and curbing online uh, harmful content. Within the research front, we also were able to map out uh, uh, and assess what are the existing content moderation practices within the uh, public entities. These are regulatory frameworks within the country and also what uh, civil society groups are doing. So. Uh, basically, that is, uh, we have research front, uh, reports have been prepared, there's a global summary of capturing the Kenyan context. Uh, so we have two very good reports that have come up next. Uh, we've been able to have consultations within the Kenyan context with the conflict communities where they've basically in, uh, highlighted what is happening within their different spaces. And uh, if most of you can remember, Kenya in 2007 went through a very tough time where more than a thousand people were killed. And that was the post-election violence. And some of these tools were leveraged actually to disseminate hate narratives. And uh, from the two assessments that we carried out within the Kenyan context, it's clear that one, the national definition of hate speech within the law that set up the National Cohesion and Integration Committee is still a little bit vague. and. L cases on hate I within digital platforms, the moment they're taken to court, there is that legal lacuna in that you can't hold w someone accountable when that specific dis definition has, is not succinctly defined in law. Um, so highlights of some of the successes that uh, we've been able to realize. 
uh, we've been able to engage young people, leveraging on UNESCO's normative instruments on media information literacy, just training them how to identify and uh, flag out hate narratives. And we've been able to do this by cooperating with fact-checking organizations uh, uh, and other civil society groups like Search for Common Grounds and others. Uh, so we've also been able to create uh, micro-learning content. These are mobile apps developed by young girls to identify hate narratives within platforms. So our strategy is three-thronged, uh, getting evidence, using that evidence to inform which necessary policy interventions we need to support national stakeholders to respond to these elements. But there's also another third front that is evidence-based advocacy where we work together, support coalitions and existing networks to be able to flag out this and hold public um, institutions responsible and just highlight what is happening. So those are some of the elements. And just a recent success is we were able to bring together public content moderators uh, working with line government agencies to actually just equip them with practical skills on how they can fact check online content um, in Swahili language because this is, a one, this is one gap that we've noticed uh, and highlighted by the research that content moderators, uh, content moderation practices by digital platforms, it's mainly in English. And if it's in, Swa in local languages, you'll find these are people based in Dublin. So one, they don't understand the national context. They don't understand the language. And the algorithms predominantly are defined to pick up narratives in English. So there is a big gap. And uh, yes. So last slide. Um, next, please. I think our slide guy is moving so fast, but I'll just highlight a quickly a few uh, findings. Uh, there is existence of online hate and disinformation, and this is actually affecting human rights online. Um, national legislation to address uh, some of these elements within the Kenyan context have some degree of inconsistency for various reasons, and that is uh, with international standards, notably in relations to protection of freedom of expressions. There's also uh, an equal allocation of social media platform resources to content moderation. What we see being allocated to the global south is totally different from what is allocated in global north. Uh, digital platforms are not yet prepared to al analyze and classify hate speech and disinformation according to local context and languages for obvious reasons. CSOs are active to monitor and respond to online harmful content, but there is a there are no strong coalitions to actually cooperate on these interventions. Some parts and challenges, lack of uniformity, I think I've highlighted that, on clear definition of head speech within different contexts, lack of transparency, concentration of powers and decision making, and some of the recommendations that are coming out of Kenya is one, there is need for preparation of global standards and solutions that can be localized and contextualized and I'm glad that our ADG just highlighted that. So in Kenya, there's an ongoing process of launching a national multi-stakeholder coalition on content moderation and freedom of, ex of expression in Kenya. Basically, the coalition will help national authorities, and that is by and large other uh, stakeholders, to come up with the codes of conduct and principles that will guide effective actions against hate speech and also the necessary ICT tools that can be deployed to identify potential harmful content. Um, also, there is the need for localization of content moderation practices. We've realized that local voices are not more mainstreamed uh, in these practices, and uh, there is continued um, need for digital literacy, fact-checking, but particularly for public content moderators because we see this as a clear gap within public institutions that have a clear mandate to handle this. I'll end my presentation there. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you, John. This is such an exciting project with so many dimensions, and I think we could have spent much more time on it. Um, you spoke about the legal dimensions, about the capacity development work on media information literacy and the number of challenges, including resource allocation. 
uh, challenges, but also about content moderation. And we come now really about uh, to the model uh, regulatory framework, and uh, we have the pleasure of having Andrew Pudapat um, joining online, I hope. Can we put him online, uh, please? onto the screen. He's a senior consultant to UNESCO and um, he's one of the authors or the key author for this uh, model framework. He will try to present it in five minutes only to you and then we will really come to the moderated discussions with your inputs too. Thank you. Andrew. Thanks, Cedric. Uh, ca can you hear me okay? Just to check. Very well. Thanks. Good. We um, so, uh, well, hi everyone. Sorry I can't be with you. Um, uh, as Cedric said, we're looking now at um, the global guidance UNESCO is producing or seeking to produce that will enable uh, internet companies to realise information as a public good, which for UNESCO means promoting both freedom of expression and access to information, but also managing content that's damaging to democracy and human rights. And I think we can't pretend this is a very easy uh, pr uh, task. There are many, many different aspects of internet policy being discussed at the moment, privacy, access, digital divides, competition policy. But I think the, the way that content is managed is one of the most controversial, and certainly in my experience, the one that attracts the most diverse range of views uh, across the planet. And so uh, uh, building global guidance for regulators or government seeking to regulate is, is a challenging task, and one that I think, as the ADG says, requires a lot of detailed multi-stakeholder conversations uh, to try and arrive at some kind of common approach. And this meeting is an important part of that process. Um, UNESCO really has five goals in developing this, this model. The first is much more transparency from the platforms about how they operate and how they manage content, not just what their policies are, which is one thing, but how they put those policies into operation. And that those content management policies are operated in a way that's consistent with human rights, whether they use automated or human processes. And obviously how the automation works is a critical issue. Um, thirdly, ways in which users can understand the provenance of the information they're seeing online, the reliability, the, where it comes from, etc. And fourthly, some accountability from the companies so that if they have policies but don't implement them, there are meaningful and timely ways for users to challenge them or certainly get redress if decisions are made that are inconsistent with the government, the, the company's own policy. And fifthly, and I think unusually um, in terms of regulatory systems, we're recommending some independent oversight and review of the regulatory system itself. Not just that you set it up and let it run with the companies, but that periodically an independent body reviews that to see if it's fulfilling the goal of, of information as a public good. Now the framework we've we've looked at um, does not require, does not involve regulators or governments deciding on individual pieces of content and whether they should be removed or left up. What the framework does is it looks at the systems and processes companies have to manage that content online. So it's very much looking at the systems and process, which is very similar to the, the, the approach adopted by the Digital Services Act in the European Union, which is a systems and process a piece of legislation. But having said that, it doesn't just let the companies decide what processes they report on. It specifies a number of areas where it thinks the company should report. Firstly, some very general transparency requirements about the company's method of operation, the way it deals with and manages content and users online. Secondly, how it sh it, that it should show how its content management policies are consistent with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. How, how it shows users can understand the provenance of information and how they are provided with an effective complaint system. And generally, how what are the different techniques that, that are used by the company to manage damaging content? So not just removal, because in some cases that's not appropriate, but is it just downgraded in search? Is alternative information provided? Is information given about the provenance of the information, et cetera, et cetera? There are different techniques companies use, and it's being having some clarity about that. Uh, and another issue on which we would like or that we are suggesting companies should report is the proposals they have for improving media and information literacy, how they protect the integrity of elections, which has been a very hot topic in a number of areas in, uh, that you, many of you will be familiar with, what risk assessment and mitigation processes they have in place to deal with risks on their platform. And finally, 
what languages they operate in, how they how how they provide access to to in 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 digital languages for people who want to complain about the platform, and how they provide access to data for researchers. So all of that is is kind of wrapped up. Those are the areas where we think um, the regulator should require the companies to provide information about its processes. And we conclude with a section on the constitution and powers of the regulatory system. And we call it a regulatory system in the guidance because there are many, many different forms of regulation around the world. There are dedicated internet regulators, there are broadcast regulators with an extended remit, and there are countries with multiple regulators where you may have a human rights regulator, a data protection uh, regulator, a privacy regulator with overlapping mandates. So we call that a system of regulation and what we try and identify are some key principles that should govern that, that independent regulatory system. Now, coming out of that consultation so far, which has been reasonably extensive, but will, which, as the ADG said, will continue through to the February conference, there are some key questions that have been identified that have come up consistently time and time again from different people we've consulted. And I think the next stage of this session is to focus on those individual questions and get some expert interventions and then opening up to a wider discussion. So I think, Cedric, this is when I hand it back to you to take us through some of those key questions. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, this was very content rich. Uh, the five goals, uh, the, the how you highlighted that UNESCO's regulation uh, focuses on systems and processes to manage content rather than saying which content should be prohibited, this, the issues and the, the four questions. So we come now to discuss more of these four questions. And um, so the guidelines for participations are quite easy. You raise your hand if you're in the room and you will get a mic um, once we get into the question. Um, but uh, for those online, please raise your hand uh, in the Zoom function for raising the hands. And you can also use the hashtag OF17 uh, if you want to use that. So uh, the first question goes to Eliska Birkova. Um, who is the uh, Europe Policy Advisor and Global Free Expression Lead for Access Now. Your organization has done extensive work on content moderation and governance, and the IGF Access Now is launching a declaration of principles for content governance and platforms' responsibilities in times of crisis. So you're very well positioned <laughs> for our first question. Um, I would like to ask you, so what safeguards could be put in place to ensure that the regulatory guidance does not lead to suppression of legitimate expression protected under international human rights standards. And we would like to project the question too, please, onto the screen so that you can continue to think as an audience uh, how to, to respond to it and what your questions and points are on it. Thank you. The floor is yours, Alice. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's a very extensive question. and. First of all, I just would like to congratulate to UNESCO on uh, completing this fascinating and super challenging project. I still remember the times when Access Now published the report uh, titled 26 Recommendations on Content Governance, which sought to establish more global position on issues around freedom of expressions and platforms responsibility. And let me say that it was a very challenging task for us to complete that report. Um, and back then we were pretty much reflecting precisely on this question too. So what are those safeguards that we want to see in place to have that human rights centric uh, platform governance model that prioritize empowerment of users and users' basic rights? Um, and I very much approve the approach of focusing on the systems and processes when regulating platforms, because for years we saw the short-sighted solutions relying on the on combating concrete categories of potentially harmful but legal content or illegal content that pretty much led to nowhere, to lack of accountability, transparency, and processes that were happening outside of any public scrutiny and proper oversight. Um, so, to start with those safeguards, focusing on the processes and more on due diligence obligations for online platforms to comply with is the key from our viewpoint. And the recent declaration that was launched just a couple of hours ago 
that tackles a set of principles for platforms or more precisely for social media companies, uh, how to actually develop adequate uh, uh, crisis response mechanisms, very much depart from the due diligence obligations. It contains a number of recommendations around independent audits, risk assessment, ex ante human rights impact assessments, as well as meaningful engagement with civil society and trusted partners on the ground that operate in challenging circumstances, including the, the time of crisis. Um, so I think, however, where we will have the main challenge when we are incorporating those due diligence safeguards, so focusing on the risk assessments and risk that stem from platform systems and processes and break them down more, uh, content curation algorithms, content recommender systems, content moderation algorithms, but also online targeting, which is inbuilt in platforms business model that is equally responsible for amplification of potentially harmful by legal content, ad delivery techniques, how actually individual content recommender systems are being optimized on what data, what data should be permissible, because we know that the abuse of data that are being then fed into these algorithms is huge, especially when it comes to categories of sensitive and personal data. That will be the main challenge. So we now have those due diligence obligations on the paper, whether in the framework that was just presented here or already mentioned Digital Services Act, and number of technical details how to incorporate those safeguards that are technically feasible is the next challenge for the expert community to figure out. Um, and maybe one final point there when we are also discussing these safeguards um, and how to actually truly technically implement that level of user empowerment that we would like to see in practice, it will be the question of the enforcement. So who will be that regulator and how we are going to grant the independence of such a regulatory body, especially if we envision a global framework. So we ultimately point out to some international regulator that should exercise that overview. And this is precisely challenging when it comes to issues such as data access framework, for instance, um, and enforcement of meaningful, meaningful transparency criteria. We need those in order to understand the impact of these systems and processes on democracy, electoral integrity, or human rights in general. But of course, if data access framework is not properly, or there is not a proper oversight in place, it can also be easily abused. Um, and these are those main challenges that we have to address in order to make those safeguards truly effective against all potential risk of abuse that now exists there. Um, I'll stop there because it was already <laughs> extensive answer and I'm looking forward for more clarifying questions. Thank you, Eliska. That was really um, a very rich uh, intervention with many different points and you stressed particularly due diligence. Um, aspect, but um, went on to so many different other points that took good note, but will not take the floor too long. I'd rather would like to give the floor to, Col uh, to people here in the audience. The mic is coming, so one, two, hey. three, four. Great, uh, thank you very much for that. It's uh, been a really useful session so far. Um, I'm, I'm here from the UK government where uh, as some of you might know, we are bringing forward the online safety bill, uh, which uh, contains a number of measures uh, with the overall aim to make the, uh, the, inter make, uh, on it, make the UK the safest place I in the world to be online. Um, uh, it, it's very similar to the Digital Services Act in many ways, but obviously, uh, in, given that it's been developed uh, in the UK for a UK audience, has some uh, slight uh, differences. Uh, I just want to kind of touch on uh, the online safety bill in, uh, in response to this question that we've got here. Uh, in terms of some safeguards that can be uh, put in place. Um, so the first thing I'd say is I think proportionality is key in everything that we do in terms of um, content moderation and the actions that we're asking uh, companies to undertake. Uh, we, uh, through our on online safety bill, we want to make sure that there's no kind of uh, undue uh, overaction by governments. We want to make sure that uh, freedom of expression is, uh, is, is boosted at, at every given opportunity. We also have um, special protections for content of democratic importance and journalistic content as well, in recognition of the importance of this kind of content in the civil uh, and public policy discourse as well. Uh. So making sure that um, that those pieces of content are are, are properly protected and not due to are, are not uh, being cracked down on uh, for for any particular reason. 
Um, I think there's also a point around ensuring that there's proper and effective user redress mechanisms as well. So making sure that uh, companies are uh, accountable and that users, users are able to, to challenge the decisions being made by companies, for example, around content moderation decisions. So for example, if a user has a piece of content deleted, making sure that they're able to pick that up with the platform uh, and make sure that uh, that can be uh, reviewed as necessary. Uh, very quickly, I'll just give uh, a couple of other uh, points as well uh, that, that came to mind. Uh, so I think, uh, as has already been mentioned, the the establishment of a really uh, of a very independent regulator looking after this, I think, is one way to also make sure that we are continuing to safeguard uh, human rights and, uh, and freedom of expression. Uh, and linked to that as well, making sure that when we do take actions which are going to restrict, uh, which are going to constitute a restriction of some sort. So, for example. If there's a decision that is made to, to block access to a certain website or, or service, making sure that there's proper oversight through the courts uh, and that there's uh, proper redress mechanisms there as well. Sorry, that was quite a long answer. Uh, I'll pass on to someone else now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Number two, we have five people wanting to intervene on that question. Please uh, present yourself uh, briefly, say who you are, but try to stick to one to two minutes. We have four sets of questions. We really want to hear you all. We also want to hear more women uh, at one point. Now we will have a first round of men, um, but uh, with this afterwards I hope more women will take the floor. Too. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Makhlub. I come from a civil society. Uh, called I Square for advocacy. We are working on advocacy. So my question is: uh, mm, uh, current tools for reporting uh, those uh, mis uh, misinformation, fake news, and others. Those reporting tools that are embedded on the social medias currently. Um, when we look, maybe in the global north, maybe they maybe use be appropriately. But when we look in a, in the global south, even the some specific groups, they miss these uh, tools to report us uh, and um, challenge the freedom of speech and factors. So how can uh, we, um, how can we solve this challenge, uh, especially misusing, or misusing of reporting tools to undermine uh, a freedom of speech? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for keeping it short too. Uh, we take very good note of every intervention, so on the online safety bill, on your intervention too, we will respond then afterwards. Uh, to, um, okay. Uh, <coughs> this is Fainoi from, from Ethiopia, from the judiciary, and uh, it's a good uh, presentation. Um, and I think everyone is raising about the hate speech, uh, the harm it's co it, it creates for society, for the order, for safety. And I feel that uh, uh, I, I think we need to have an international instrument that help us to combat hate speech. Uh, I know that it is a local local context matters in uh, combating, in preventing hate speech, but having an overarching convention that could galvanize countries to combat hate speech is very critical. If you don't have such a galvanizing conventions like we have for the uh, Child Rights Convention, Corruption Prevention Convention, as other, other conventions, then every country would took it to its sanders and uh, it, it would be uh, easy for the government to suppress even freedom of expression. Therefore, having a conventions, I think, is very critical. Uh, therefore, what uh, is your stake on this? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I would also like to applaud you um, to this project. My name is Christian Jeffer. I'm professor for law, science, and technology at the Technical University of um, Munich, where we also look into these um, uh, these questions. And I, I really follow your approach as concerning safeguards. I would like to um, flip the perspective a little bit and say, um, how do you, with such a process-driven approach, how do you safeguard um, the interests of those most vulnerable? Yeah? That, that don't have the capacity to oppose and to um, uh, to use um, fora like NGOs to express their uh, their needs and and their questions. So the European Union in the DSA has a has a clause on participatory mechanisms, um, but it's it's uh, very lofty. 
and I think um, uh, this is really, um, apart from overreacting, uh, for me is also a question of, uh, of underreacting, which, um, uh, if I may, uh, a, a second short question, how do you turn this procedural approach into a safeguard? Because um, we looked at the transparency reports um, so far, um, and um, also at best practices, and we're shocked that actually there are very few, so it's it's not um, it's not clear how to apply other um, forms of risk governance to this um, uh, to this area. And the great danger is if you don't have a kind of race to the top and have good processes or have the company review their processes, not only report them but also improve them. Um, uh, it's uh, it's hard to see um, how the situation can be improved in a in a meaningful time span. So how do you um, make them improve their processes with your framework? That would be my second question. Thank you so much. Uh, we have in the back the last uh, question. Of course, the most vulnerable are at the center of our preoccupation. So uh, and thank you for also the question. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Raúl Echeverría. I'm representing ALAI, uh, Latin American uh, Internet Association, private sector. Um, the, I had the privilege to participate uh, last year intensively in the, in the declaration of Windhoek uh, Plus 30. And I'm very proud of the work we did with that declaration. I think it's a very balanced declaration. But the, and the declaration also uh, include and remark the, the, the positive impacts of, uh, of internet and the, the digital development in the exercise and protection of, uh, of human rights, especially uh, freedom of expression. I think that's that, uh, in line with what the, the president of ICANN said this morning in the opening ceremony, not everything about uh, internet is bad, and we have to, uh, to remark the positive impacts and the contribution to the, to the humanity. And the other, the other thing that is very important from Windhoek Plus 30 is that um, it speaks, uh, it's, uh, there, there in the declaration there are recommendations and ask for every party, for all stakeholders, for governments, for private uh, companies, and also for the, the community in general. And the, the, with regard to these uh, discussions, uh, we are very committed with this discussion and, uh, and we share the concerns that, uh, that initiate the, the, this process. And we co-organized it with civil society organizations last week, uh, uh, an open consultation in Latin America. And uh, we received the first draft, the, we, we, the, we received the, the draft only 10 days ago. So the first comment is that this, proce this process is uh, it's very short to February. Um, I really expect that the expectations of UNESCO is not to adopt uh, the document in, uh, in February, but just to initiate a, a longer discussion. And the, there were in the meeting there, uh, last week, there were a lot of concerns uh, from different, from parties from different stakeholder groups, uh, including civil society. Uh, one of the, of the, of the, of the concerns is that uh, there are no mentions to governments in the in the in this uh, uh, in, in this document. While in Windhoek plus, plus thirty, there are a lot of recommendations and ask to governments. And the is the it seems that the regulation it's not no it's not that it seems it's clear that the the, the, the regulation is the objective of the document and the objective of the process. Um, my humble contribution would be that the objective would be, should be probably not the, 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 the regulation itself, but the, to protect the rights of the, the, the users and give the, and improve the transparency and, and many other things. Um, for that, we have to develop a lot of uh, good practices in a multi-stakeholder uh, fashion with uh, commitments from different parties. And of course, very probably there will be need to some kind of regulations, but the regulation should not be the objective itself, but just the one of the pieces to uh, to achieve the, the objectives that uh, we are trying to 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 achieve. Other other concerns, and I, I will stop here because I have many others. But uh, we will submit, of course, uh, uh, our our comments. Is that uh, we have to remind that 
uh, half of the population live under uh, governments that uh, are not democratic. And a good part of the, of the population live under authoritarian governments. And we have to be very careful that, and I think that this uh, is a, a concern that is shared by many, that the, the <laughs> a, a global guideline for regulation uh, the, doesn't become a tool for um, empowering uh, authoritarian governments to implement more restrictive uh, policies to access uh, in, to contents in general, to exercise rights. Thank you. Thank you so much for also these points and questions. Uh, one was directly to addressed to uh, UNESCO, and I'm talking here under uh, the Assistant Director General's uh, views. Uh, th this February conference will be a, a consultation, so it's a tight process, uh, but it is not uh, something where uh, uh, something will be adopted, if I'm right to say that. Um, or I, I leave the final words to my ADG. Uh, but let me um, uh, now have a brief response uh, from uh, Eliska and uh, also from Andrew on the questions raised in the content. I will do my best to be brief, although this is the list of excellent questions and we could have probably five other panels dedicated to those. So the first one was the question of abusive notices. And indeed, this is the problem since uh, we started even discussing the issue of platform governance or platform liability. Um, and there are a number of, I would say, procedural justice safeguards that can be put in place in order to at least mitigate that level of abusive notices. Some of them have been already mentioned, and this is, by the way, also connected to reporting illegal content or presumably illegal content, so we go a little bit beyond the scope of this panel today, um, where, for instance, the right to submit the counter notice uh, the statement of reasons on what basis uh, the platform reacted and uh, what ca what uh, precise provisions in the terms of service were actually violated in uh, clear language communicated to users, either those uh, who are authors of that content or who initially shared that content, can help to mitigate the negative impact of abusive notices or simply also to, pro to provide then more precise definition of what is a valid notice, um, uh, which is something we also strongly advocated for uh, in the already mentioned the European Union Digital Services Act. We even had that idea that there should be specific system of notices for specific categories of content. Um, and there is also the system in Canada, so-called Notice and Notice Plus, uh, that you might look into that also provides more safeguards how to actually tackle abusive notices. And I'm happy to discuss it further. Uh, very briefly on the UK safety bill, I just would like to underline that the UK safety bill specifically singles out a uh, legal but harmful category of user-generated content. Um, yeah. As of today, well, that's fantastic if that's the case, because that would be, and that is strongly against the essence of the DSA, also as uh, against what actually UN Special Rapporteur commented on the UK safety bill. Um, I'm not sure whether thank I remember all the comments now, but if you want me to step here, I can. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, we don't have so much time now, uh, because uh, Henriette will... Uh, uh address the next question. Henriette is well known here to the IGF as former chair of IGF's MAC. Uh, she has also led uh, the APC, the uh, Association for um, Progressive Communications for many years and is now a senior advisor. The question to you, Henriette, is um, from your perspective, um, uh, what provisions are needed to ensure the independence of regulatory systems? Is it unrealistic to think an independent regulatory system can be established? Um, Thanks very much, Cedric. And well, first, I also want to congratu congratulate uh, UNESCO for tackling this very difficult task. The short answer to that question is, yes, Cedric, I do think it's unrealistic. <laughs> um, you know, I think we've, in the, in the communications, the telecommunications, information sector, we've been struggling with regulatory independence since 1990 or since the 1990s. And, and what we've learned, and Alison actually is better equipped to speak about this than myself, is that um, independence um, of a regulator 
um, in practice requires much more than having it constituted as an independent regulator. In fact, some regulators that are not independent might act in a more independent way. When I say not independent, as their budget might be covered by national government, but they could act in an independent way. Some regulators are independent financially, but they don't act in an in independent way. Regulators are constrained in developing countries. They uh, um, fear litigation by operators. They fear political intervention by governments. We've also learned that often, even if the regulator is independent, if the political environment and the policy environment more broadly with regard to communications doesn't give them a clear mandate that allows them to act independently, they're not independent. And the moment we start talking about content, we are talking about human rights. Um, how can a regulator that operates as an independent regulator in a country where there isn't political will or, or, or um, systemic respect for human rights be expected to play a role in regulating content from a human rights perspective? So there are so many reasons. So where, you know, whereas I really commend the system, I like the idea of regulatory um, of a system. Um, I think to expect regulators, whether they are converged or not, or whether you, and also it's not clear to me whether you want the, the emerging new regulators. Many countries now have information regulators. That's a consequence of data protection legislation and freedom of information legislation. They're struggling. They're struggling to be effective data protection um, uh, legislations. They're struggling to enforce compliance with freedom of information legislation. And now we are going to expect them to play an, an effective pro-rights anti-huge, big, multinational platform <laughs> role. Um, so I think it's tough, frankly. I think the other thing here, and I think this is really one of the difficult things to deal with, and I'll be quick, uh, Cedric, is that hate speech is spoken by, s by people. Platforms amplify. If we're going to introduce a regulatory system to combat harmful speech of any kind, it needs to include dealing with those that speak. I must say in my country, in South Africa, we have quite effectively used our Human Rights Commission, um, um, our National Human Rights Institution, and courts to prosecute um, people who are perpetrating hate speech online. So, so and, and I think that has to be part of the equation. And then when it comes to the amplification, by platforms. I think we need to look at principles, and I think UNESCO is getting there, but we need to look at how to target the business models and all the role players in those business models. That includes the advertisers that benefit from amplification of extremist speech, and it involves also collaboration with the, with the regulatory institutions in the countries where those companies are registered. So. I think this is a very important project, but by establishing 193 national regulatory institutions and expecting them to bring about what we want to achieve, I think we might want to rethink. Do the principles, come up with a framework, absolutely, we do need to do that. But let's be very realistic about the feasibility of having that framework um, complied with. Um, um, at the, at the uh, kind of at that distributed level, and let's learn lessons from the 30 years of telecoms liberalisation. Thank you so much, Henriette, also for your, your critical uh, questions and approach. This is why we're having the consultations because we want to build on on your experiences and and uh, are also looking for your guidance on which kinds of provisions are needed in the fact uh, to to translate uh, this project into reality. Good. Um, I will now go directly to Alison. Uh, we will have the speakers respond to the questions, and afterwards we will project all the questions, and you can pick and choose, and Andrew will come in then too, just in terms of time. We need to listen to all um, colleagues here in the panel and for the intervention. So, Alison, uh, you are the Executive Director of Research ICT Africa. Thanks for joining us um, again, and uh, you're an African digital policy and regulatory think tank um, leader and specialist that has worked across 20 um, African countries. Um, so the question to you is really um, about the notion of information as a public good uh, and protecting free expression and the right to information um, while dealing with the damaging content um, 
is that notion of uh, information as a public good easily understood? And um, what are the implications of regulations in this uh, approach and field? Um, thank you very much for that. I was just going to say I'll also confess that I'm a former broadcasting regulator and telecoms regulator. So my approach might be a little more regulatory than others might think. But it's really in, in, in going to your question about you know the, the use of the terms you know, public good and the use of digital public goods. But uh, before that, I just wanted to respond to your um, five principles and just say that you know I, I really, really feel there's a critical principle missing there, and that is access. Um, I know you bring it up in relation to specific communities like research communities or um, do some specific um, access to, to um, uh, information um, communities, but really, um, you know, th the governance of global digital public goods um, in terms of digital rights, distinct from the underlying infrastructure and citizens' access, is to deny the majority of the world's population the right to information. We're simply going to continue to um, perpetuate, you know, it's just, uh, the internet, which currently you know, the vast majority of the world are, are excluded from. And even f the vast majority of those who are online are actually not really able to um, optimize or to um, benefit from the information that is there. As you pointed out, you know, we've got whatever it is, 80, 90 percent of the language, is in you know, content is in English. So these are really um, uh, important issues. And I think they go to the issue of um, uh, regulating public goods and I think this is an important issue because it's coming up in different forms in different parts of the UN and is of course used outside of that but I think you know um, the you know the infam the problem the problem is obviously that uh, you know digital public goods have, have are not good just goods that are you know, for good for the public I think we, if we return to the kind of economic regulatory concept of this good then it allows us to make certain demands and put certain obligations on the people who are publicly or privately delivering these public goods. And so I think it's very useful to return to it. And I, you know, just to identify, I know this will be very obvious to many people, but you know, the, the classical um, public good was, was public broadcasting. And that's because it's, you know, it's non-rivalrous and it's non-excludable in the use, in the dissemination, in the um, uh, transmission of those airwaves nobody else's information or content or um, utility is reduced in that process. Um, and so your know, digital goods absolutely very much fulfill this data, cybersecurity, all of these things very much um, fulfill the, the non-exclusionary, non-rivalrous um, nature of that. Many of these are made exclusionary by their private um, commercial uh, uh, value that's, that's, uh, that's derived from them but, you know, in, the, in the process of production but they are fundamentally um, uh, non-rivalrous and, and, and uh, non-excludable goods. So this is, uh, this is um, becomes quite important from a regulatory point of view because it um, means that you know, if, uh, regulate, uh, if um, broadcasters or if telecommunications operators or if ever it was, were using public resources such as you know, spectrum or airwaves, um, they, they were, were, you know, had to use those in a certain way because they were public resources. Likewise, you know, the internet is a public resource, it's a public good, and if people are operating on it in a fashion that is um, you know, essentially a, mon a monopoly, there, isn't a re there is no reason why they should not be regulated in the public interest, just like other users of, of these uh, goods. Um, the fact that um, you know, the private uh, sector or the private um, has really expanded at the expense of the public realm over the last, you know, uh, three, two or three decades, um, you know, doesn't mean that uh, we, we, you know, we shouldn't be pushing back at that. And there is, of course, in this proposal, there's an attempt to do so. But it's very much in the terms of the, of the big operators and what they're doing. So it's saying, okay, in terms of what you're doing, you need to do this better and you need to have better oversight. But it's not actually saying, well, this is, you know, the, this scarce resource is now being allocated purely on commercial um, supply-side valuation of, of the, so the people who have the most money, they've already got the um, market access and these kinds of things, are now 
you know, able to play the game on their terms, but they must just moderate that behavior. Whereas if you look at the um, kind of public uh, goods regulation spectrum or in internet or anything else, then you would say, well, what would, it, what would it, you know, demand side valuation of this be? What would be the demand side valuation that recognizes the value of this resource as an input, either if it's data into markets or as an input of inform as information into democracies? This is a critical information conduit um, um, for democracy and therefore um, we are going to emphasize the demand side value of it. And we're going to um, ensure, for example, in the access to the internet, that we create a commons or we create you know, uh, uh, data lakes or we're gonna create content and information commons that people can, can draw and, and, and use. So while I think the system is you know, a, a kind of start at least at, at um, regulating the systems and the processes, I don't think it really, you know, it goes far enough at all from a regulatory point of view. And I'm, I'm talking about an enabling regulatory environment. I'm not, I'm very, I mean, as I said, I would be equally concerned about the censorship nature of it and those kinds of things. Obviously, that freedom of expression is absolutely important. But I'm really concerned with the kind of enabling aspects of this, not the um, sort of compliance aspects that go with the, the traditional kind of rights framework that, as has been pointed out, actually doesn't um, exist in many countries. So, I mean, the, the real challenge is that that, um, public goods regulation has traditionally happened and, di and digital goods were operating at the national level. That's the um, national you know, the reform models that we've got. And the real challenge is how do we extend that to global governance because that's really the requirement that we have. And I think you know, that's the really tricky part and I think that's where we have to not think laterally and we have to not think in terms of traditional relationships between states and markets and citizens um, and you know, multilateral bodies and that sort of thing. I think we have to think far more creatively there about new forms of public than, than traditional notions of public. We need to think of you know, uh, new forms of, of, of delivery. And you know, as I said, we do have experience of private delivery of public goods. We had that with telecommunications, it happened by concession, it happened by regulation. So how in this environment, in this really unenforceable in a way, except by kind of mutual consent, um, you know, or more suasion or something, how in this environment do we actually ensure that we get those um, uh, you know, public interest outcomes at a, at a global level. So I think, I mean, this is, I think this is one of the very tricky things, and I think there are mechanisms that we have to look at that don't only look at national regulation, that look at these different publics that are informally and formally regulating. So a lot of the informal regulation that has happened around advocacy groups um, is, a, is a new form of public uh, regulation, is a new form of public uh, expression. And I think it would be wonderful in this document to just look beyond kind of national regulators, which um, I think a number of people have pointed out, are already facing challenges and um, problems of enforcement. Thank you so much, Alison. It's uh, wonderful to hear all the inputs and questions and points, but also the point that you're thinking as a former regulator that we're not going far enough some of the aspects, um, but also the global dimensions. Um, I will now ask Manuk Cox uh, to come and intervene online. Um, please, on the um, third question. Um, Mano, are you there? Can you hear us? I will introduce you first. Uh, you are the head of um, the sector in the European Commission, DG, DG Connect, many of you will know, where you cover the global aspects of digital services and platforms. Last month, the European Union adopted the landmark Digital Service Act, which was referred to in our discussions today already, and whose implication will be felt worldwide. Um, based on the experience of developing the DSA, do you see hazards in trying to set out a global policy on regulation given how varied political systems are around the world? Well, thank you so much um, for giving me the floor. Can you hear me well? Very well, thank you. Great. Um, yes, the question is also really important and i think that's reflected by the various comments we've already heard um, in the session today uh, about specifically those hazards in trying to set out such a global policy let me start though by saying that it absolutely makes sense uh, in my view to promote regulatory excellence on uh, digital services and the way we mitigate the societal um, harms they they create Within the EU, you already mentioned that the Digital Services Act 
um, is now law since the 16th of November. Um, and we, uh, as regulators, now focus on enforcing these rules, but they cover, of course, a 27 member state block. Um, and so this already is quite uh, an, ef an effective way also of getting um, platform companies to the table and uh, developing this necessary regulatory uh, expertise um, and also, of course, generating all of the um, benefits through enforcing the rules uh, that you get from engaging the community around platforms uh, and through the various transparency obligations that are included in the Digital Services Act. Um, in this sense, I think it is important to stress that this 27-country uh, um, set of rules um, will benefit the globe also directly because, indeed, that the research that will be done under the Digital Services Act will be public and can inform about problems that we face around the world. And we do indeed share a problem statement around the world. Um, the research into content moderation in minority language is also an issue within the EU. Uh, the, under the Digital Services Act, um, the EU market will also build up auditing capabilities necessary uh, to indeed audit um, the algorithmic recommender systems, for example, to name uh, one of the many elements that will have to be audited, but that are, that are specifically um, complex and for which you need specific expertise that will be built up and available uh, to the rest of the world. So in this sense, um, again, focus is on enforcement domestically, but with direct benefits. And I also believe that sharing the expertise that will be built up by the regulator uh, will, will make sense. And this is because uh, we share the same context. That's already been mentioned, of course, um, but the, um, the global platforms that are active around the world and have user bases in the billions of users, um, they face issues um, that we share. And I, I do believe that the EU platform regulation, so the Digital Services Act, but also the Digital Markets Act, in that sense, translate universal values. Um, so this is not about selling a, a certain brand, either the um, EU Digital Services Act or, or a Canadian or UK approach that we heard earlier, but uh, to try to see how we can uh, safeguard those universal values for citizens around the world. Um, and here, I think one of the key universal values that we talk about uh, is no longer having to face a trade-off between, indeed, freedom of expression, the uh, right to access information, uh, and the safety of our citizens. Um, and I believe the Digital Services Act does that in a way um, that would also benefit citizens out around the world, which is namely to use regulation as one important piece in a much broader puzzle uh, to empower citizens. And they do that, of course, through empowering society. We will have, hopefully, societal content moderation instead of content moderation by any given actor, be they government, platforms, uh, or other entities. Just to mention very quickly that the DSA also has obligations for trusted flaggers and for auditors um, and for researchers. So it really addresses the, the whole ecosystem around platforms. Um, and in the sense, the essence of the approach is that um, regulation need leverages that ecosystem. Um, and when I then get to the question of a model regulatory framework for, for the world, um, what we should perhaps think about is what we are asking governments around the world to do. Um, and it was already mentioned, um, whether it makes sense to ask all uh, 193 governments to impose obligations on platforms, which is how the uh, framework is currently uh, phrased, uh, or whether it is about um, indeed sharing best practices, um, learning, uh, and at the same time getting platforms to protect citizens uh, better in uh, all jurisdictions where they are, uh, where they're active. But perhaps one role that the framework could play is actually explain that platform regulation can only be implemented if a minimum minimum societal ecosystem is in place and that the focus should be on building the required ecosystem of trusted flaggers, uh, journalists, researchers, 
also international cooperation structures um, which are necessary for any regulation that focuses on processes and procedures and leverages this ecosystem to function. And, and we know from the 194 examples that were mentioned and, and tracked by um, the United Nations colleagues working for the High Commissioner, um, that there's very little positive to say about any of those um, uh, regulatory attempts that, that are done around the world. So perhaps it is really about um, looking first at what is already there um, about sharing best practices, about uh, supporting the, the building blocks that need to be in place, um, and at the same time, um, focusing uh, the conversa on the conversation with platforms as the regulatory framework also tries to do, to make sure that um, the uh, necessary protections and existing mitigation measures are extended to, to benefit to, um, uh, citizens around the world. In the meantime, what is also very important um, is that we, and I think it was mentioned as well already, is that we uh, focus on uh, researching possible effective mit mitigation tools because we need uh, to acknowledge that um, resources are, are limited and that indeed this, the status quo is that um, there is a focus on, on English as the dominant language, um, that there are many jurisdictions in which global companies are active and that definitely more has to be done but also uh, we we now have an opportunity to think about the mitigation measures that uh, we desire and that we believe safeguard human rights including uh, through the use of technology and content moderators or whose well-being also has to be taken into uh, the equation um, so very much a, a call for continuing the discussion and this good initiative but um, indeed thinking closely about uh, who we are addressing and um, with what um, uh, obligations or, or principles. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. There were so many um, stimulating inputs and we were delighted to hear that you think there needs not to be a trade-off between freedom of expression and the regulatory frameworks. Then you mentioned a lot of challenges <laughs> which are linked to it. Um, but now I will still uh, give, um, if there is um, a woman who would like to take the floor, uh, they will have priority in our short um, time frame we have. Otherwise, I will ask Andrew uh, to come back uh, to us. Yes, please. Uh, otherwise, uh, now because it will be noted this way. The transcript will not work otherwise. Oh, right. Um, hi, I'm Aishwarya. I work at the Center for Communication Governance, uh, which is a research center that's based in Delhi. Um, I just have one, I think, broad comment that I was curious about um, when looking at the model framework, which is generally that I'm not entirely sure how it interfaces with the current um, like safe harbor obligations that platforms would have, because what we're asking them to do in a, in a large sense is to more intensively moderate content, which I think we can all agree is broadly necessary um, and maybe and this is not obviously an intractable issue it's just that I think when we're proposing a regulatory framework that heavily impacts how platforms look at content and especially I understand that it's not meant to be like a directive the regulator and the state is not meant to have control over the content in this case either um, but then I think it's just important to engage with what exactly we're expecting platforms to do in like because the safe harbor framework is just created in a way that it incentivizes overcompliance to a certain extent to maintain that status. And so it's when we're talking about safeguards, I think it's also important to then think about how we're enabling um, you know, uh, different points of view. So for example, when we're talking about the fact that we need to include counter narratives, we're essentially asking platforms to pick what those counter narratives would be um, to highlight them. And so then how do you come up with the with a system in which you identify credible flaggers, your trusted partners. Um, again, I think it would just be important to engage with, with how we're expecting platforms to do what they're going to do and how that will intersect with existing obligations um, under different frameworks. Also, I'm just echoing the part about the need to, like, I think, be realistic about um, regulatory capacity um, because I, I mean, again, we're expecting like a fair bit and I know that this is where like regulation generally is going overall. We're expecting plat audits, et cetera. Um, so to see how we can sort of maybe reduce that burden, share it across more stakeholders, uh, have more of a multi-stakeholder process, so we're not expecting one authority to do all the heavy lifting. Um, so, yeah. 
Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this intervention with a lot of additional questions to Andrew, <laughs> but also important points. Um, Andrew, uh, can you, um, is there some? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I can't pretend to answer all of the questions because although I've taken detailed notes and obviously be reflecting on a number of them. So just maybe three or four very general points. I mean, firstly, UNESCO is not a naive organization in its secretary. It understands the world in which it operates and it understands the imperatives that are bit that are driving the conversation. And well, there are a, a very substantial number of pieces of legislation around the world past passed or in the process of passing by member states that are seeking to regulate content on the in online and a number of member states ask UNESCO what should we do how should we do this if we you know we're concerned about some of the things that are happening on the platforms in our country some of the incitements the rise of the violence whatever how do we deal with it and what UNESCO is trying to do is say well if you if you intend to regulate or you want to regulate content these are the kind of it's the kind of framework, these are kind of principles, these are the kinds of things you should think about when you're introducing legislation to protect for expression and rights of information and also to deal with that uh, damaging content. It's not the, the, the framework or the, the, the guiding principles are not, they're not going to fix the internet. There's no pretense that this will fix the internet. This won't deal with all the issues around privacy and data protection. It won't deal with access and the digital divide. It won't deal with competition policy. It won't deal with a whole range of issues. The, the internet is a, a massive global phenomenon that requires a whole series of different, hopefully coordinated policy approaches to fix the different things that need fixing. And this is just taking one piece of it, which is around the way the content online is being managed or not being managed at the moment on a number of significant social media and search platforms. And so let's, you know, we want to be realistic about what we're trying to do. We're not trying to fix everything. So there are things that people have raised that won't be in scope of, of the legislation. I think it's specifically a response to Raoul, because I know that this has come up before, the next iteration of the paper will deal with the responsibilities of governments, uh, mostly telling governments what it shouldn't do in terms of intervening in the shaping and delivering of content. And it will also recognize the wider societal responsibility. Uh, I think as um, someone else said, the internet is not just a set of technical tools, it's a, a set of human interactions. And human people, human beings are responsible for the way behavior manifests on the internet. And it's amplified and directed and shaped by algorithms and by search and by a range of other factors. But you can't eliminate the responsibility of all of us as people for the way we behave online and for human behavior. So that's something that I think will have to be acknowledged. And, and finally, I think uh, I, so I certainly recognize that to achieve global consensus on content regulation in six months is not feasible or possible and probably not desirable. And that what this process is, is a contribution to a debate that I imagine will roll on through many more years and will need to broaden out through many more constituencies. But hopefully it will be an informed contribution that will help shape the debate at both national and global level about how we deal with content online and how we ensure that people's human rights are respected, uh, not just in terms of our ability to express ourselves, but our ability to provide a safe and secure environment for people and particularly vulnerable groups when they operate online. That's probably it, Cedric, at this stage. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. And we are aware also that there are a number of comments which were made online. Um, I think uh, we will certainly take them into account uh, as, uh, because it's difficult to sum it up now uh, and we're a little bit under time pressure. Uh, I think it was a very rich discussion and I invite now our Assistant Director General uh, to close um, our meeting with a few remarks on the way forward too. First of all, I would like to thank you all, panelists, Andrew online and you, the audience for such a rich exchange. The fact that you are still in the room 20 minutes or 25 minutes after the scheduled ending of this session shows the interest you have and we thank you for your engagement. Uh, uh, certainly what you heard is a lot of food for thought. I started maybe stating that uh, did not, in my mind I had three questions. Why doing this? I think I addressed that. What to regulate and how to make it happen? I think many of your questions are on the what, and Andrew was very clear on what is outside of the scope of our attempt to regulate. 
that was very clear. Now, how to make it happen? And thank you for your input, Sorshu, from your rich experience as a telecom and broadcaster regulator and others. Uh, I think, uh, the, uh, as you say, the devil is in the detail. How to make it happen and how to make countries abide by it worldwide. Uh, this is very important uh, input to us going forward. You know, this is version one that we uh, presented to you. Your inputs will uh, inform us, will reach the debate. Uh, the next version will be published on the UNESCO website on December 9. So uh, stay tuned uh, if you are still interested. Uh, connect to the website and, and see that, uh, that draft. Uh, in January, there will be another revised draft because, of course, the consultations with the experts and third parties will continue in the meantime. I realize the time is very short uh, because we announced this er uh, last May and the conference is in February. So we didn't, give ourselves, we didn't give ourselves even 10 months to do this gigantic piece of work. But again, time is of the essence. We, uh, we could have said, let's take three years to work on this. What, what, what would happen in the meantime? At least we initiated a discussion. We tried to start to move the needle, even in a modest way. As we, as I believe in a saying, start big, uh, sorry, think big, start small, scale up fast. We had a big vision, we had a big am ambition. We, is, we are starting small, what we can achieve within 10 months or a bit less. And then maybe we can scale up fast, maybe we move to something else. Don't quote me on this, but maybe, maybe, if our leadership agrees to it, we may consider down the road a UNESCO recommendation on this matter. This is not on the, on the table now, it is not. But I'm saying that there are many avenues to say how can we allow ourselves more time? How can we have deeper consultations regionally, thematically? And how can we come up with something more solid and deeper? That for that, we need time for sure. It's not our target for next February for now. We'll do what we can, of course, time permitting. Uh, let me say also that uh, certainly would like to have you join us for the conference, either online or in presence uh, in Paris and the February. Let me remind you of the, webs, uh, the, the, the website or the email address for further co contact. It's called internetconference at unesco.org. Internet conference in one word at unesco.org. And I think, you know, back to uh, uh, the, our uh, IGF uh, forum, you know, this morning there was a plenary session of trust and security. The, the leading title of our conference is we want to build the interest, uh, internet for trust that we trust the information on the internet. We, we trust the human interactions that uh, Andrew referred to, to them online. So again, I think trust is, is, is a central theme here, and this is maybe the hook with the IGF and some of the issues that we have been discussing here. Again, thank you all for being here, for your input, and we hope that you can continue together this exchange and this debate. Thank you.